Okay, hello everyone. Um, welcome back to the Reconnect web conference. Uh, after focusing on democracy in these morning's panels, uh, we now begin our afternoon sessions devoted to the state of the rule of law in the EU with a stimulating and very timely topic, which is the relationship between European courts, the European Court of Justice and national courts in their respective jurisdiction. We will examine this in the context of the German Constitutional Court judgment on the public sector purchase program of the European Central Bank made in May 2020. A rather controversial case, also due to its timing, as it was decided after the announcement of the ECB's pandemic emergency purchase program, even if the judgment was made on unrelated ECB measures adopted in 2015. We will discuss the questions and challenges this decision has raised, many of which go to the heart uh, of the at times fraught relationship of the European Court with national courts, with a panel of eminent experts in the field who I will in introduce in the order of presentation, starting with Professor Dieter Grimm, uh, Professor Emeritus of Public Law at the Humboldt University in Berlin, and former Justice at the Federal Constitutional Court in Germany. We will therefore, therefore be able to give us key insights uh, from the perspective of the German Constitutional Court. We're also very glad to have with us Professor Kim Lane Skeppel, Lawrence Ro Rockefeller Professor of Sociology and International Affairs at the uh, Princeton School uh, the University uh, and the University Center for Human Rights at Princeton University. And of course, Laurent Pech, Professor of European Law at Middlesex University, London, who is also Principal Investigator in the Reconnect project. After the opening statements by our, our speakers, we will then have a brief Q&A with selected questions from the audience. Please send your questions to me via the webinar chat box, indicating who you would like to reply. It's now my pleasure to give the floor to Professor Grimm. Okay, hey, thank you. Uh, I think I should start uh, <clears throat> by saying that this conflict between uh, the two courts, the ECJ and the German Constitutional Court, uh, did not come out of the blue. Uh, it has deep roots and it goes back to uh, the early 1960s. That's to say to the time when the European Court of Justice uh, proclaimed that European law takes precedence over national law, including national constitutional law. This was by no means clear at that time. One couldn't find anything about precedence in the text of the treaties. The member states that participated in the law uh, suit said they hadn't agreed on anything like that. And even the Advocate General couldn't find precedence of European law in uh, the treaties. Nevertheless, this is now history. It happened more than 50 years ago. And the German Constitutional Court was the first court to accept uh, the precedence of EU law over national law, although not unconditional. And uh, the reservation, among the reservations that the court made, the one that is relevant for uh, our problem uh, today, uh, was the reservation that uh, legal acts of the European, then European communities that are not based on a competence transferred by the member states to the European Union are not applicable in Germany. So as we used to say as lawyers, ultra virus acts. What was not contested is that European legal acts need a competential basis in the treaties in order to be a valid law. The principle of conferral is foundational for the European Union. The EU is no state, and it can act only in so far as it has been empowered by the member states. What is contested, however, is the question, who has the power to determine whether there is an ultra-virus act or not? The ECJ says that this is exclusively its competence, Whereas the German Constitutional Court says, in so far as Germany is concerned, it has the last word. How can one explain such a controversy? 
I think at the bottom of the conflict are two different understandings of the sources and the legal basis of European law. The European Court of Justice says European law has emancipated itself from the member states' will, and it flows now from an independent, genuinely European source. The German Constitutional Court says European law can claim validity in Germany only because the German Parliament ordered that it be applied in Germany and only to the extent that Germany transferred powers to uh, the European Union. Based on this difference, on these different premises, on these different assumptions, both, both courts derive the consequences from the premise in a logical and consistent way. The Federal Constitutional Court asks whether Germany has transferred powers. The ECJ asks whether the EU has received powers. And given these two different premises, two different uh, 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 assumptions, a reconciliation between the two positions is difficult to imagine. So both uh, allege that they are the guardians of the principle of uh, conferral. Now, the German court has some doubts as to to what extent uh, uh, the ECJ uh, uh, really it does what it alleges to do. Uh, the, European, the, the German court sees an erosion of the principle of uh, conferral and it sees an erosion not by open violations, but by, uh, uh, how should I say, but by a way that the European Court stretches the, com com the competences that have been uh, uh, conferred to the European in an overly uh, way. Uh, the European Court is not regarded up to now as a neutral umpire between the Union and the member states, but still as a motor of European integration. Uh, and the means to pursue this end is uh, the primacy of European law over national law. This gave the European Court the opportunity to declare national law inapplicable, and it has done so extensively, but hardly has any European law been declared in conflict with uh, uh, the European treaties. At the same time, the European Court immunized itself against the political branches of uh, the European Union because everything that has been regulated on treaty level, so to say constitutional level, is withdrawn from the democratic process. Therefore, this is, I think, the conclusion of the German Court, the only efficient counterweight against the powers of the ECJ are the national constitutional courts. Uh, the federal constitutional court asserted this uh, uh, long ago. Maastricht uh, judgment uh, was the first explicit mentioning of this. Uh, so the question is, why did it take so long uh, until the court made use of uh, what it had claimed all the time? I mean, this Constitutional Court had several times serious concerns uh, about uh, European politics and judgments of the ECJ. This was particularly so in the OMT case. You may remember uh, uh, Draghi's uh, uh, pronouncement that uh, the ECB will do everything that is necessary to save uh, the Euro. So this was the first time that the German Court referred a question to uh, the European Court about its concerns about uh, the compatibility of Draghi's announcement and the program with the treaties. The answer that the court received from Luxembourg was not regarded as satisfactory. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the German court, uh, so to say, swallowed the answer because at least the European court said that the ECB has to respect legal limits that flow from the uh, treaties. Now, it was the same with the uh, uh, ECB case, the PSPP uh, uh, case. Uh, according to uh, the judgment of the German court, the ECB did not apply the principle of proportionality when it uh, handled this program. 
principle of proportionality, which is, is required to apply according to Article 5 of the treaty. And the ECJ seemed not to be willing to review the activities of the ECB in a strict and serious way. So what the court, German court did was to bar Germany from further participation in the PSPB program unless the ECB can show that requirements of the principle of proportionality have been uh, observed. Now, what are the consequences uh, of this judgment of this conflict between the courts for European integration? Is the European legal order a danger? I don't think so. Uh, the EU exists, uh, has been existing when, uh, for more than 60 years. We have three cases where national constitutional court declared that uh, the European Legal Act is not uh, applicable in their uh, respective uh, countries. So I think one cannot say that this is a serious danger to uh, the legal order uh, of the European Union. A question that has been raised in reaction to the judgment is that uh, the danger lies elsewhere. The danger lies there that this German judgment can be seen as an invitation uh, to other member states' constitutional court to follow uh, this example, and uh, especially courts of member states where populist uh, and Eurosceptic political parties have taken over. But I think we should clearly see the difference between Germany and these states. Uh, in these uh, states, the question is to get rid of uh, restrictions of the rule of law and democracy and of European uh, uh, dominance. In Germany, the goal is to ensure that the European treaties are observed. And finally, my, my, my strongest argument against this idea of invitation for other countries is can you really expect, can you really expect of judges? to decide deliberately against what they think the law requires only in order to prevent misuse of the judgment. Finally, last word. The EU is not a state. The question whether it should be a state or not can be discussed, but at present it is no state, which means that there is no closed hierarchy like in a federal state. And this is also true for the judiciary. The ECJ is not what an appellate court would be in a state. That's to say no court, neither the national court nor law in the European court can reverse the judgment of the other court. And this forces the courts to take into consideration uh, the uh, way of reasoning and the attitude of uh, the other uh, courts. But of course, that has to be done mutually, not one-sidedly. I think the ECJ is still on the side where it has to learn on this. And if I combine some hope with this conflict between the courts, it is the hope that the mutual consideration may be taken more seriously in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Grimm, for this uh, initial overview that, that set the stage very well, I think, for, for our discussion and, and kind of clarifies uh, the different approaches in EU legal doctrine that are at the heart of uh, these, these questions that we are, we are looking into, but also uh, that reveal, I think, different approaches uh, related to conceptions of legitimacy, of course, in the European Union uh, and the roles that constitutional courts can, can play therein. Uh, I would now like to bring it to the discussion, uh, Professor Skepo. Uh, thank you so much. It's always very difficult to follow Dieter Grimm as a presenter. So what I thought I would do is switch points of view. And that is to think of this, this decision that we're talking about today, this PSPP decision of the German Federal Constitutional Court, as presenting an opportunity for a constructive constitutional moment in European law. And if we think about the basics of constitutionalism in whatever system we're thinking about, one of the basic principles of constitutionalism is that every power has a check on its power. 
And we see that, you know, even if the EU is not a state, it nonetheless generally follows this principle of constitutionalism in most of its affairs. You know, the commission can only sanction a member state if it either goes to the court and gets a confirmation or if it passes legislation in conjunction with other institutions. You can rotate this through every power the EU has. The one possible un unchecked power in the EU as it's structured is the power of the ECJ itself. And I think that over the history of the EU, there have been two checks on the ECJ's power. So one is, of course, treaty reform. So if the ECJ has announced that the treaties as constructed lead to a principle that the member states disagree with, they can engage in treaty reform. The problem is, as the EU has grown, treaty reform has become more difficult because it requires unanimity. And especially now when things are very polarized, it is almost impossible. So the EU has become a lot like the United States in this regard where we have an unamendable constitution and that puts extraordinary powers on the court because the usual method of correction isn't there. So then the question is, how else is the power of the ECJ to be corrected if the view of other actors in the EU system is that the ECJ has exceeded its powers or not used its powers appropriately? And here again, we can look at the history of the EU and there has been over that history, a constructive dialogue between the ECJ the Court of Human Rights and the national courts, but particularly the German Federal Constitutional Court, which I think has just taken this responsibility quite seriously. Um, and this is where it seems to me we need to worry a little bit about how the ECJ has proceeded over the last years, because the ECJ was once quite willing to engage in this dialogue with the other courts and to learn it wasn't always a happy dialogue, but eventually the, e the ECJ adapted and realized it lives, it swims in a sea of other high courts that are all trying to achieve the same purposes. You know, and now I'm worried that the ECJ doesn't think that anymore. So the ECJ has made two decisions that I think have shown that it's less willing to listen to other courts. And I think this is a sign of trouble in the EU. So one was the decision 213, where the ECJ rejected the possibility that the Court of Human Rights would have any uh, joint capacity, shall we say, to interpret EU law. And decision 213 was a pretty rude judgment, uh, as many commentators have said. It really made it so difficult to imagine that the EU could accede to the European Convention on Human Rights, that the project has basically died for now, even though the treaties require it. And the second decision that shows that the ECJ has been quite unwilling to think of itself as a co-equal court with others, achieving a common goal, was the decision in this Galweiler case that Dieter Grimm referred to, the OMT case, in which the Federal Constitutional Court, <clears throat> believing that the European Central Bank had exceeded its powers under both the treaty and the charter for the bank, referred a case to the ECJ. The German Federal Constitutional Court in Galweiler said, we think there's a problem here. And it was a very thoughtful, well-reasoned decision under EU law saying, here's what we think EU law requires. Don't you think so? <laughs> and the ECJ responded by saying, nope. You know, and really, first of all, didn't answer half of the objections that the federal constitutional court made. And second of all, issued a decision that just didn't even seem to comprehend what was at stake when the Federal Constitutional Court referred the decision. So Galweiler is the real predecessor to what's happened now with, the, with this decision that we're discussing. And I wanna put it in a different perspective. I think Dieter Grimm has of course done a very good job of explaining the internal logic of the decision, <clears throat> excuse me, but what I would like to do is to put it again in this kind of historical European perspective. I think we should think of the PSPP decision of the Federal Constitutional Court as a decision very like the Solanga case. It's not on all fours doctrinally and it doesn't require the same thing. But if you recall, there was also a big kerfuffle <laughs> when the German Federal Constitutional Court said in Solanga that, that rights were non-negotiable. And they said it not because they were trying to make some specially German argument, but they were saying, we would never have signed on and we suspect the other member states would never have signed on to a European Union that didn't recognize the common tradition of rights in the member states. And if the ECJ won't step up to the task of enforcing and elaborating and taking seriously those rights, we will, we will do this as a backup. Right? 
So if you look over the long haul, and we're right at the beginning of the PSPP thing, but I think that Solanga is what's going to happen um, in this particular case. It's often forgotten, first of all, that the federal constitutional court said in Solanga 1 that in addition to rights, the court was concerned that the EU did not have a fully democratic mandate. That part's often been dropped out of our discussion of Solanga. But in fact, the EU responded very strongly to the Solanga decision by in fact sort of correcting the EU. So the ECJ actually found rights, both in the European Convention and in the common constitutional provisions of the member states. That was part one. Part two was that the ECJ learned how to do proportionality analysis of the rights bearing sort. Now, proportionality analysis in this decision is a different proportionality analysis, but, but still, the ECJ gradually switched its decisions from the French style declarative judgments to more German style constitutional reasoning judgments over the course of the Solanga debate. And treaty reform brought an elected parliament. After those, after those changes, the federal constitutional court said, fine, we are now satisfied. We don't have to do our independence rights review. So when you fast forward to the financial crisis, what you see is the same thing is going on, but with a different set of principles in EU law. <clears throat> Excuse me. So as, as Dieter Grimm said, the ECB, Mario Draghi, did, made his famous we'll do whatever it takes um, uh, pronouncement, stabilizing the markets. But the ECB began a whole series of unconventional measures that it is never justified to anyone. And so the Constitutional Court in, in Gauweiler picked one of those measures, this OMT measure, which in fact had not been used, right? It was a very good place to test this because it wouldn't challenge any ongoing program that had in fact proved essential in the financial crisis. And the Constitutional Court being constructive said, don't you think the ECB needs to you know, say more about what it's doing and why, and that it has to think about its role in the European system and how the ECB itself follows European constitutional principles. <clears throat> and the, you know, ECJ said, nope, <laughs> not really. We think this is fine. And the Constitutional Court went along with that judgment, um, as Dieter Grimm mentioned. And so now we have Weiss. And the stakes are much higher because now this, PC, this PSPP program is actually one of the essential components that the ECB has used to deal with the financial crisis. And because the PEPP, which, is the, which was the proposed successor to this program to deal with pandemic issues um, and a financial crisis to come from the pandemic, these are actual live programs. So that's why everybody's now excited about it. So the federal constitutional court decision in the in this PSPP case, I think we should think of as Solanga revisited, not on the rights question, but on this question of democratic accountability. And democratic accountability is a principle of the German constitution, as you see in the PSPP judgment, but, it, but the German court doesn't assert it just to say that Germany's special, right? The constitutional court asserts it because it believes it's also a principle of the EU treaties. And so how is it actually enforced in the EU treaties? It's through the interpretation of Article 5, which includes the principle of conferral, which separates which functions are, are retained by the member states, which are in the EU, and also the principle of subsidiarity, which is not really flagged in this judgment, but that's part of the Article 5 constellation of how the member states in the EU are to be, uh, how, to, how to interact. And then also particularly the principle of proportionality. And so what I see that, the, the German Federal Constitutional Court doing in this case is saying the ECB, the ECJ has a job to do, and that is to ensure that the institutions of the EU honor these principles. So the first responsibility is for the EU institutions themselves to honor the principles. That's why the ECB needs to explain how is what we're doing monetary policy and not intruding on the competencies of the member states in economic policy. So the ECB at least has to make that calculation. And if the ECB doesn't make it, then the ECJ has to make them do it because the ECJ, as the primary interpreter of EU law, which by the way, I think the court is not challenging, you know, the ECJ has to make the institutions do it. And if the ECJ won't do it, just like in Solanga, the federal constitutional court will say, a check on the power of this institution requires 
that we do it for them if they won't do it for themselves, right? So I take this judgment not to be hostile against the ECJ, although it's, it's pretty rude. <laughs> I think it could have used another draft. I think there's a there's a backstory here, which is the judgment was announced on the very last day that President Bascula was in office, and that probably sped the thing up and made it less polite than it might have been if it had gone through another draft. But still, I think what the federal constitutional court is saying to the ECJ is you have a bigger job to do than you think. You need to expand your own powers. You need to ensure that the actions of EU institutions actually comply with the treaties. And just as in Solanga, if you don't do it, we will. We're the backup. We're not the first line of attack. We only do it if you fail to do it. And so I think in this way, the German Federal Constitutional Court is saying, yes, ECJ, you are the primary interpreter, but checks and balances require that if you don't do your job, somebody else has to do it and we're the ones doing it. So finally, one last comment. Why is this not like Hungary and Poland? And I agree very much with the analysis that Dieter Grimm mentioned. There's a big difference between a court that says, we're in this together. We have a common project, our national constitutional project, and the European Union. And what we all jointly have is the responsibility to ensure that the constitutional values we share are enforced across the whole system. And the German Federal Constitutional Court jumps in as a last resort. If it feels the EU is failing, it did that before in Salonga. The EU got better as a result, and I think that will happen here. That's different than what's happening in Hungary and Poland, where these captured constitutional courts are saying, you have your values, EU, and we have our values and ours are different, and our constitution allows us to go our separate ways. That's a totally different project, and I think the ECJ is absolutely right to come down on Hungary and Poland and saying, you signed on to EU law as a commitment that your constitution supported at the time that you signed on. And if you feel your constitutional agreements now do not allow you to participate, then you are free to leave. That's where I hope and think this is going, thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and thank you for uh, bringing into focus another important uh, dimension of this debate, which is, of course, uh, as you say, democratic accountability and um, democratic accountability is a European principle, which uh, national courts may have a stake in as well. My pleasure now to uh, give the floor to Professor Laurent Pesch. You should unmute yourself, we can't hear you. Uh, sorry, uh, I was just uh, still thinking about the arguments uh, from uh, Professor Grimm and Kim. Um, I'm afraid I have a much more critical assessment uh, to give during my, te my ten minutes, which I have divided essentially is uh, in nine critical points and uh, one recommendation slash uh, warning. So I'm going to highlight uh, about uh, nine main issues I'm having with the, uh, the ruling of the German uh, Federal Constitutional Court, which I'm going to refer to quickly as the FCC, because my German is not good enough to use the German abbreviation. So I'm just going to call it the German FCC or OFCC. So to begin, to begin with, my first uh, problem with uh, the German FCC ruling in this case, which was adopted by seven judges against one, so the, it was a, a chamber of Senate of eight judges, and if I'm not mistaken, the judgment was adopted by seven judges against one, uh, but the dissenting judge did not actually adopt the dissenting opinion. In any case, to begin with, my, my first problem with the ruling is that, uh, as Kim said, uh, essentially uh, the arrogant, uh, if not patronizing tone is uh, disappointing, uh, not to say uh, that it was possibly completely unnecessary. Uh, I refer here in particular to the description of the ECJ judgment, uh, the relevant one, as not tenable from a methodological perspective, simply untenable, simply not comprehensible, objectively arbitrary, uh, and the German FCC also referred at some point to justify this uh, very harsh criticism to traditional European methods of interpretations, but the German FCC uh, left them completely undefined. So actually, after reading the judgment, I still don't know what they meant by traditional methods of interpretation in Europe. Also, what I found uh, disappointing uh, was the fact that the German judges did not shy away from accusing the ECJ of contradicting its own case law. 
Uh, I'm afraid, however, uh, that uh, the experts of the ECJ case law uh, disagreed uh, with the German understanding of the ECJ case law. So, uh, in my view, there are some aspects of the ruling where, in fact, the German FCC possibly could be accused of a misleading uh, account of the ECJ case law, leaving the bits which are inconvenient to its reasoning. But uh, my time is limited, so let's, let me move to my second main issue with uh, the ruling. The judgment itself is very excessively referenced, but uh, having a lot of ref references doesn't mean that the judgment, the reasoning is itself uh, clear or compelling. In fact, uh, yeah, the judgment itself has been regarded by many experts as being itself uh, uh, incomprehensible in part in its own logic, while at, at times also offering not much, if any, reasoning at all. And here I'm going to refer to the presiding judge of the German Federal Court of Justice, uh, uh, which uh, wrote on his blog, uh, at decisive points, there is no reference to other judgments, but what is more, there is no reasoning uh, at all uh, in some parts of the judgment. Uh, so the, the reasoning itself of the ruling is not itself uh, beyond reproach, I would say. Uh, so possibly the ruling of the German FCC itself can be uh, described as uh, not comprehensible at some points, at least, of the ruling itself. Third, uh, the FCC ruling can be viewed as a quite uh, self-centered, uh, German-centric uh, ruling. Indeed, the, the art of the criticism originating from the seven German FCC judges is that, uh, at least it can be understood, uh, are, are them demanding that the ECJ does adopt their own understanding of the proportionality test in EU law. So we have here a German court telling the Court of Justice or to apply uh, the EU test of uh, proportionality, including when it comes to balancing and identifying uh, conflicting interests. Uh, as noted by Professor Elef Teriadis uh, in a very critical blog uh, whose uh, findings are fully shared, um, it's not open to the German court or any other national court to impose its own administrative law to other members. Uh, the very idea that the state of the EU would seek to impose its own rules uh, in all others in defiance of its treaty obligation is simply repugnant to the rule of law. A uh, fourth uh, problem I'm having with the ruling, uh, the use of the ultra vires approach in this case. Uh, now, perhaps uh, it may be useful to recall that the ultra vires approach of the German FCC is actually a creation of the German FCC itself. So yes, you can criticize possibly the Court of Justice for discovering the principle of supremacy in the 1960s, but then let's not forget that the German FCC here also adopted uh, the ultra vires approach out of the blue, possibly. Uh, even if one does agree with the ultra vires approach as a potential good check on the ECJ, and I do believe myself in accountability and checks and balances, Possibly the ultra vires approach here, at least you could argue that was used in a way which is not fully compliant with the own case law of the German FCC regarding the restrictions on the use of this ultra vires approach. Uh, fifth, uh, I think also I have an issue with the use or the reference at least to the concept of constitutional identity in this uh, uh, ruling. Uh, now, the constitutional identity argument was not used actually uh, to essentially nullify the ECJ ruling in this case, or the, to, to annul the, or to find the ultra vires, the ECB decisions. But I have to say, I find it quite an overstretch uh, to link uh, constitutional identity and the overall budgetary responsibility of the Bundestag. So that's my fifth problem with the ruling. Um, six, uh, violation of the EU treaties. Uh, in, so you cannot deny that the German FCC judges have violated EU primary law in the name possibly of respecting EU primary law. But the, the bottom line is that they have, they have violated one of the most fundamental principles of EU law, which is that the Court of Justice alone has jurisdiction to rule that an EU act is contrary to EU law. And what is more, they've done so in a field of exclusive EU competence. And this is why I'm not sure I agree with Kim when she does refer to the Solange analogy. Uh, the Solange analogy has nothing to do with uh, an EU act in a field of exclusive EU competence. So I'm not sure whether, but I guess we can discuss this in the Q&A. Um, um, seven, uh, the, the FCC judges, that's an additional problem I'm having with the judgment, is that they gave themselves the authority to adjudicate 
uh, in an exclusive area of EU competence for which the EU, uh, the, sorry, the FCC has no competence in a technical or even uh, legal sense. Uh, he has been, the FCC ruling has been described uh, by one commentator as a breathtaking arrogation of power. And I would tend to agree with this very harsh, possibly, assessment, but that's one I share. Uh, eighth, uh, the ruling has given uh, a boost to autocratic regimes and their uh, puppet courts. Now, uh, I do agree uh, with uh, Professor Graham and Kim that it is true, in, in a way, that you could argue that, in fact, uh, the uh, FCC here is asking for more demanding judicial review over ECB acts. So essentially not asking for less, but more uh, uh, judicial review by the Court of Justice. That is true. I don't, I don't disagree. But the bottom line is the FCC uh, judges have uh, taken upon themselves in violation of the EU treaties, I would agree. I would argue uh, to find both an EU act and an EU judgment in breach of EU primary law. As uh, Professor Samiento and uh, Professor Weiler put it, um, uh, in the name of the rule of law, uh, in this case, the rule of law was breached by the German FCC. Also, uh, let me refer to the president of the EU General Court here, uh, who said, uh, and I agree, uh, although handed down in the name of the rule of law, the FCC ruling could paradoxically reinforce the dismantling of the rule of law in certain member states. And in fact, something which has been missed by most commentators, it is already happening in Poland uh, a few weeks, a month prior to the German FCC ruling. In fact, uh, the Polish Constitutional Tribunal essentially nullified uh, the preliminary ruling of the Court of Justice of 19 November 2019. Uh, and they did so on the exclusive basis of EU law. So they didn't do so on the basis of their own uh, interpretation of the Polish Constitution. They actually use Article 2 TU uh, to uh, disregard the case law of the Court of Justice regarding the rule of law. Now, I'm not saying that the German FCC is the same as the uh, captured constitutional tribunal. No, that's not what I'm saying. In fact, I agree with the departing head of the German FCC here when he described the Polish constitutional tribunal now as a, not a serious court, but a puppet court, obviously, which is no longer issuing rulings, but mostly just doing the bidding of the ruling party. And the last problem I'm having with the ruling itself, uh, uh, when you look at the long-term possible effect of the ruling of the FCC, uh, has to do with the integrity of the EU legal order. Professor Grimm was very optimistic here. I'm afraid I'm much more pessimistic about uh, the long-term potential misuse of the German FCC reasoning. In fact, we don't have a I, I have, I'm aware of at least three rulings of the Polish Constitutional Tribunal nullifying uh, the application, uh, nullifying essentially de facto uh, ECJ rulings and preventing Polish judges from applying EU rule, EU rule of law standards. Well, I think we are uh, in an uh, existential phase, an existential crisis as far as the EU is concerned. Uh, uh, but my time is limited. Uh, sorry, Alex, uh, uh, you're gonna hate me. I'm not sure how long I've been speaking for. But just one last point, um, just one recommendation and one warning. Um, I'm afraid, uh, I know it's not uh, an easy call to, to make, but I'm afraid the Commission has no choice but to launch infringement proceedings against Germany and should do the same in respect of uh, the Polish Constitutional Tribunal. I would personally welcome infringement proceedings against both, just to make clear that uh, there is no double standard uh, in the EU, even though you cannot compare, obviously, the German FCC to a uh, capture constitutional court, uh, in both cases, we have violations of EU law. Possibly, uh, in the case of the German FCC, you could simply argue that uh, the right thing to do would have been uh, would have been to make a second reference to the Court of Justice if they had comprehensibility uh, issues with the first uh, ruling. And uh, if we don't do that, if the guardian of the treaty does not launch infringement proceedings, uh, I'm afraid what we're going to see is uh, multiplying the multiplication of uh, de facto uh, specific sectoral mini Brexit uh, in uh, many areas of the EU law. So I think I'm afraid I'm much more concerned about the long term effect of this uh, FCC uh, ruling adopted by seven judges. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Laurent. And thank you for 
sharing your, your concerns with regards to essentially, I guess, the unity of EU law uh, in light of, of, this, of this judgment. I will now go straight to our Q&A with the audience, as we already have quite some questions coming in. Um, with the first round of questions that I address to uh, some of you, to, to all of the speakers and some are direct to some of you in particular. Um, Sara Pauli asks uh, Professor Dieter Grimm, uh, do you think that the Commission could and should open an infringement procedure against Germany as a result of the judgment of 5th of May 2020? And again, uh, Sara Pauli to Professor Kim Skeppel, uh, do you think that the Constitutional Court is fully equipped to carry out a legal assessment of the validity of the PSPP? Um, what would happen to the EU if all constitutional courts in Europe declared a judgment of the Court of Justice ultra vires? Um, we then have a uh, question for Professor Laurent Pesch. Um, he uh, starts by um, highlighting that uh, the judges have on several occasions emphasized uh, that it's important that it is important for the ECJ to develop EU standards of proportionality. And the question is, how would you react if the German Constitutional Court would have explicitly developed its own specific standards of an EU proper proportionality test? And then perhaps the final question, which I can add from Tamara Capeta, uh, again to uh, Kim. Uh, questioning um, the idea that the ECJ uh, did not check on the competencies of the ECB. In fact, they did, but in a different way. Um, and the question is, the German Constitutional Court would do it differently, but should we think that this is the only possible way uh, in this uh, circumstances? Back to you. I think the first question, uh, the, first to me, uh, the first part of the question can be answered very easily. Of course, the European Commission can bring a treaty violation uh, case to the ECJ. This is its power. The second part of the question is more difficult to answer, should it or not. Uh, now, it seems to me that uh, the problem with uh, the ECB not applying the proportionality principle uh, has been solved as far as uh, I can see. Uh, so there was a long period of reasoning of the ECJ how, I could, how it could comply with the expectations of the German court without directly addressing the German court. Uh, and what has happened is that the ECB has submitted its considerations for the program uh, to uh, uh, the German government. The German government has examined them. The German government says, I'm satisfied with what uh, the ECB submitted. So the proportionality question seems to be solved. And of course, there is no answer required from the German constitutional court. The constitutional court could intervene only if the new case comes. So let's say if Herr Gauweiler or one of the usual suspects brings again an individual complaint. But uh, there is that the court is no longer involved. So this problem, this basic problem, seems to be solved, whether satisfactory or not, doesn't really matter. What is not solved is, of course, all these problems uh, that Professor Fish said. So the conflict itself. Difficult to say. Would it be wise? What would it mean? Uh, uh, we can be sure that if a treaty violation case is is brought, the ECJ will say, yes, Germany violated the treaty. This can be taken for sure. Now, we are in a situation, since the European Union is no state, that uh, uh, the conflict is, cannot be solved on a legal basis. Both courts claim to have the last word. And there is no superstructure to solve this case. So the solution is a political solution. And if uh, this happens that the Commission brings a case and the court decides, as I expected, to decide 
then you would push the German government in a position where it has to decide who to follow its own constitutional court or the ECJ. And whether this is wise or not, I doubt it. Yeah, so I guess I'm up next, yeah? Um, so actually, I, I wasn't asked the question about infringement proceedings against Germany, but I, I just wanted to add something to what um, David Grimm said, which is that, um, and this goes to the constitutionalization of the EU and how it's done. If you have a conflict between, a principled conflict between the ECJ and a member state over what EU law means, like not over whether national law, you know, not what's happening in Hungary and Poland, those are different kinds of questions. But if you have a good faith court trying to say what EU law means and the ECJ is like, nope, we're the, we're the highest court. Um, you can't refer that to one of those two courts. <laughs> there has to be some third party that adjudicates that dispute. And that's where I agree with, with Dieter Grimm that this, there is no other third party except a political resolution. But that's why I think the federal constitutional court decision was so smart because it didn't, while it nullified, it had to nullify the decision of the ECJ to do what it did, which was to essentially say to the German government, because that's after all the only authority that the German court can speak to, that the German government can't participate in carrying out actions of the ECB unless the ECB does this proportionality analysis. And then, and this is the answer to the question that was addressed to me, the court didn't do the analysis. It said the ECB has to do it. And now, as Dieter Grimm has said, the ECB has done it. And, and here, I think the German Federal Constitutional Court was not going to, in fact, it even says repeatedly in the decision, it's not that PSPP is necessarily a violation of the conferral principle. It's that somebody has to think about whether it is. <laughs> and as long as the ECB thinks about it, I think the Federal Constitutional Court would say fine. And that's where, you know, the, that basically this is where the, the, what the message that the Federal Constitutional Court is sending to the ECJ is, you have to take this into account. And I think the Federal Constitutional Court is saying, we're very likely to defer to you as long as you take, make a serious issue of this. You need to incorporate this. This was the problem with Vice, that the federal that the ECJ did not even think about conferral as an element of its judgment. And now the, the federal constitutional court has put the ECJ on notice. This is part of your responsibility. And we will defer to you if you make a good faith effort. I don't think the federal constitutional court will substitute its EU law judgment for the ECJ if the ECJ does its job. Laurent, you're muted. <laughs> I keep doing this. Uh, um, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, very interesting debate, uh, as always. Um, uh, now, before I answer the proportionality uh, question, um, I think, Kim, you mentioned uh, uh, what, what an important factor. Are we dealing with uh, a good faith court here uh, uh, from the point of view uh, of this uh, conflict between the German FCC and the ECJ. And personally, uh, I have my doubts regarding the good faith nature of, I know it's a quite strong accusation for me, but uh, let me just give you uh, two concrete examples, which when I read them, I was a bit, uh, to be frank, uh, quite shocked. Um, there is one moment in the judgment where essentially the FCC is saying that the Court of Justice would have, would have deliberately, that's my uh, paraphrasing, uh, deliberately rendered the proportionality test, test meaningless in this context so as to enable the ESCB to pursue an economic policy agenda by means of bonds purchase. Now, this is a direct uh, quotation from the ruling. Essentially here, the FCC is saying the ECG abdicated deliberately its role when it came to proportionality assessment in order to let the ECB essentially pursue an economic policy instead of a monetary policy. I don't have the economic expertise to agree or disagree, but as a lawyer, I found this bordering on the conspiracy theory. Uh, so whether this is a good faith interpretation of what happened, I'm not sure. Also, there is a bit of a misleading in my view, a summary of the ECJ own case law. Uh, so essentially the German FCC picks and chooses the most damning aspects, but does conveniently omits uh, the aspects of the case law, which would actually render its criticism 
a bit less convincing. Uh, for instance, what I mean by that is essentially the German FCC tends not to pay much attention to areas of the case law uh, where the uh, ECJ has also adopted a very lenient uh, proportionality test, uh, especially when it comes to very complex or social economic uh, issues of complex importance, which uh, require, according to the ECJ itself, uh, a less strict degree of review because you cannot simply double guess uh, the legislature in the name actually of democracy. So you know, we have to be careful also of justifying uh, increased judicial review in the name of democracy when the increased judicial review actually leads to uh, democratic institutions actually being double guessed by judicial uh, entities which are not democratically elected. We are talking also about uh, the ECG here and uh, the lack of a last check, but who's double checking the German FCC uh, if it does adopt an abusive interpretation of EU law, whereas uh, it does engage, or when it does possibly engage in uh, abusive use of ultra vires uh, approach, who's left then to double check uh, the German FCC itself? Uh, so, I mean, it's not uh, simply a one-way street, it has to be a two-way street. Uh, so, let me quickly finish and then possibly, Kim, you can reply to this point. <laughs> uh, regarding proportionality test, uh, in fact, uh, uh, I would argue that the Court of Justice did undertake uh, the proper proportionality test, uh, even though it may not satisfy the German FCC, but we are in, in an area of very complex uh, uh, decision-making matters. And the court, courts have to also be mindful uh, that sometimes they don't have the expertise required to double guess the legislature or in this case an independent uh, regulatory body known as the European Central Bank which is independent because of the will of the masters of the treaty including Germany therefore. So you cannot really uh, complain about the Court of Justice uh, respecting uh, the letter and the spirit of the EU treaties when it comes to judicial review of ECB acts. That would be uh, my reply. May I respond? <laughs> Unless we have more questions. We do have more questions, so perhaps a very, very brief word and then we go back yeah. to the audience. So just a, a, a quick uh, thing. So on who checks the federal constitutional court? So one big difference between this decision and say the Hungarian and Polish decisions that we've both been very critical of is that in this case, the German government did not want this decision. <laughs> this is not something that is providing cover for, you know, the, the, the government to, to essentially exit the EU without exiting the EU. The German government, I'm sure, did not want this decision. The constitutional court's check is the domestic check of the government, of the parliament, of and the fact that the German constitution is quite easy to amend. So now the German constitutional court in this case cited a lot of unamendable provisions of the constitution, which is what it usually does with constitutional identity cases. But there are elements of conferral. It literally says the German government could, you know, retroactively approve these uh, new powers. It could change the German constitution to allow the new powers. It gives the German government a lot of ways to check it. Okay, so I think it has checks. But just the last thing, this is part of a long, I mean, the criticism of the German court has come primarily from people who don't really study the German court. And I must say, I started with German constitutional law, backed into EU law from there. So this is why I'm, you know, I'm, I tend to, I think, uh, take the, have a more sympathetic view to the German side of this. The German constitutional court has been elaborating now over many years, a kind of theory of democracy that I think is really interesting. And the German court believes that, that democratic legitimacy can come from two sources. One is directly from elections, which the EU is missing, except for the parliament, but the other is through reason giving. So if you're not an elected body that has electoral legitimacy to fall back on, then you have an obligation of public reason giving. And they're holding the ECB to the same standards that they hold, in some sense, the ECJ, right? If this is not an elected body, the way that you show accountability is to explain, to show your reasoning, right? To show how you arrived at the decision so that those who can check your power decide whether you've abused it or not. And I think that's the standard the federal constitutional court is using. And I think, frankly, it's a standard the EU should adopt for itself. Thank you, and thank you for the wonderful uh, discussion on these on these issues. I will go back now to the audience for a final um, round of the, the Q&A before we bring this panel to a close. Uh, we have a, a 
number of questions from Professor Dan Kellerman, um, who asks, uh, bringing into 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 focus some of the issues that have been already discussed. If 27 national constitutional courts can declare EU acts, including ECJ judgments, non applicable in their courts and countries, then how can the EU legal order possibly function? Won't EU law end up meaning different things in different states, violating the principle of equality uh, and uh, basic rule of law norms? And perhaps you can uh, comment further on that. Uh, then we have a question from Oliver Mader. Does the principle of proportionality, Article 5, 4, the EU provide for substantial criteria to be applied when the ECB takes a decision on the adoption of PSPP, PEPP, or are such substantial criteria of encompassing assessments and prognosis to be drawn from elsewhere? We then have uh, a question from uh, Mr. Michael Mayer. Resenda, who directs it to uh, Professor Dieter Grimm. Uh, we can all understand that the Federal Constitutional Court and the ECJ have different interpretations. Both interpretations of the law have plausibility, but the federal uh, German Federal Court declared that the ECJ decision is completely implausible. Are you convinced that the legal matter is so crystal clear one can say so confidently that the ECJ got it completely wrong. And he refers once again uh, to the harsh words reflected in the uh, legal conclusion um, that, uh, again, the ECJ got EU law completely wrong, as, as he puts it. And then uh, we have a reflection uh, from Alfredo Rizzo, which perhaps you can comment on, uh, who says, I agree on the fact that the Solange uh, line of cases doesn't fit perfectly in a comparison to the current cases. However, one must admit at least that the German judges have expressed always the same concerns. The true difference today is that the German tribunal has decided to address to national institutions, uh, asking them uh, not to apply relevant EU law sources. This is really unprecedented uh, in terms of breaching all of the main principle of political and legal integration. And this is particularly worrisome uh, in this uh, context. Uh, I would give the floor again to uh, Professor Grimm and then the uh, rest of the panelists. <coughs> Uh, I think I start with the third question, which was di directed to me in immediately about uh, the legal uh, the legal matter. Uh, let me first of all say, had I been in the position to write the judgment, it would have read differently. Uh, I think there was no real necessity to use the words that you also, Professor Page, rightly uh, criticized. But I can explain why the court used this terminology. One year after the Lisbon judgment had been rendered, uh, the court had to decide again on European matters that the court used this decision. It's called Honeywell. The court used this decision to clarify under which conditions it would refuse uh, European legal act applicability in Germany. And it put the hurdles very high. First of all, said we will do it only after having referred the question to Luxembourg. Secondly, it said, we don't do it if we have a difference in interpretation. This happens constantly among uh, lawyers, but only if we have a clear violation uh, of the treaties. And in addition to that, number three, even then we do it only if it, if it doesn't present just a single case, but if it, if it uh, uh, ends up in a power shift from the member states to the European Union. So the court had put the hurdles very high and court was caught, so to say, in a trap that it itself had laid and felt now that it has to use the language of the Honeywell case in order to show that in this moment, the situation had been arised. I think that could have been avoided and it would have taken out much of the, of the sharpness 
of the conflict. The conflict would have remained the same, but it would have taken out some of the, of the sharpness of the conflict, and there could have been a possibility. I mean, if I had had to write the judgment, I would have said, we explained in Honeywell under which conditions we don't follow, and these conditions are given in that case, uh, without saying that it is arbitrary and totally incomprehensible. It's not arbitrary in any sense of arbitrariness uh, with a uh, reproach uh, or, or an individual fault of the ECJ. So, uh, briefly, to, with regard to proportionality, uh, in Germany, proportionality is only applied when it comes to limitations of fundamental rights. But this is not the case for the for Article 5 of the treaty. It, is, it applies in every uh, European decision, that's to say also in competential uh, questions and questions like East European Bank. Of course, the uh, principle of proportionality may have a different meaning on the European level than on the national level. It's in Germany, it's extremely elaborated, and one cannot expect that this standard is adopted by everyone. But what I think is it cannot be uh, uh, cannot be uh, left out, is that there has to be some sort of balancing. If there is a core meaning in proportionality, it is that there has to be some sort of balancing, but it doesn't have to be the German type uh, of, of balancing. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, back to the, the first question. Of course, if 27 states, each on its own, declares that it does not accept this, uh, a ruling of the ECJ, we are in a difficult situation. But is this a real danger? Is this a, a real danger that this happens? I also think that we shouldn't make a fetish out of unity of European law. In no national system at any given time, there is unity of the national law. You can reach unity over time when in one question, the last instance says it is ruling. But here you have already new, not unities in national law. The national legal system is able to bear a lot of disunity, and I think we shouldn't be so afraid uh, of that. In principle, I agree, of course, you cannot have a common market and a European community or union if every member state has the right to, to pick what it likes and to leave out what it does not like. This is totally clear. But uh, we are not uh, in front of this uh, danger. I think this is what experience tells us after 63 years of European integration. Yeah, if I can pick up from there, I just, this is the, the decision we're discussing today is the decision of an exasperated court. And you can feel it. You can feel it in the tone. You can feel it in uncharacteristic, I wouldn't call it exactly rudeness, but something that heads in that direction. And it's because the German Federal Constitutional Court has been signaling since Maastricht that this was a problem. And every time it's been polite, nobody's paid attention. This time, and, and you know, it, it, we've all read the articles, right? The court barks, but it doesn't bite. It won't bite, it won't bite. After Gauweiler, it was like the court will do nothing. So this time the court had to say something. So the court did not order the German government to um, pull, or the, or the Bundesbank to pull out of the ECB now. What it said was the ECB needs to be given three months to justify itself. And if it doesn't, then they must pull out. And of course, what's happened is the ECB has done it. And then this leads to the question about the standard of review. So what is the standard of review? And I think that Dieter Grimm is right. It's, it's sort of an administrative law standard that, you know, a good faith effort to balance everything will by and large be accepted unless there's something egregiously omitted, which is basically what the federal constitutional court said. Unless you consider a conferral, you have egregiously omitted something. And I suspect there'll be a deferential treatment of what the ECB says as long as it says something. Um, on the question of, you know, chaos in 27 courts, this is where, you know, maybe I have a more romantic view of the EU back in the days before I started paying attention to it. <laughs> but it seems to me that, you know, there has been, but I, I always, the way I learned it originally, right, was that there's a set of courts that are all working together toward a common purpose. And this was, again, the Salonga lesson, right, that Salonga pushed the ECJ to get, to get better. Right, and that that was, and that the the Court of Human Rights has done exactly the same. And so, if you see the national, you know, P courts, the Human Rights Court and the ECJ swimming in a common soup, aiming, you know, soup is not the right metaphor, but you know, working on a common project with common goals. 
then it should never be the case that 27 national courts say the ECJ was wrong. If so, it means there is really a serious problem. And the ECJ should be able to anticipate what those national courts are saying if they're all working on the same project, which again means Hungary and Poland are not working on the same project. That's a different case. And that's something that the EC, ECG, you know, ECJ needs to be able to call out. But otherwise, we need more dialogue among the courts. I think that's the, the bottom line. So, sorry, it's, uh, I guess, uh, my turn uh, to uh, conclude uh, this very interesting debate. Uh, so, thank you, uh, Professor Grimm, and thank you, Kim. I uh, just wanted, uh, possibly, uh, just to, uh, to make a quick comment regarding, again, uh, whether it, this is, in fact, a, a ruling in good faith. And let me uh, reiterate uh, my doubts about this, if only because of the arguably selective uh, summary of the ECJ case law when it comes to the application of the proportionality test. According, uh, I'm not an EU law uh, rule, uh, I'm not an EU expert uh, on the proportionality test, but uh, I've read uh, a lot about it. And uh, according to uh, proportionality experts I've read uh, in the past uh, few weeks, the German FCC actually got it wrong. Uh, so uh, uh, when you get possibly wrong the case law of the Court of Justice, possibly you may want to express yourself uh, uh, in uh, more uh, subtle and uh, softer terms than accusing the Court of Justice of not understanding its own case law, or worse, deliberately misapplying its case law so as to allow the ECB to make policies in breach of EU primary law. So I found this FCC ruling very disappointing, and I'm not convinced also that it was done for the right reasons. Uh, the right reasons would have been essentially trying to uh, force the EU into complying better with the foundational values on which it is based. So I have no issue uh, with the Solange line of cases, for instance, because yes, uh, the goal here is quite clear. We want the EU to, to conform itself with the ideals on which it is based, respect of the rule of law, respect for democratic ideals, respect for human rights. But here, possibly wrongly, uh, the feeling I had uh, when reading the German FCC ruling is that, in fact, uh, the German FCC ruling was not happy with uh, the policy itself and decided to, to use the proportionality test as a stick with which uh, to beat both the ECB and the ECJ, but not for the right reasons, simply for policy reasons. Essentially, uh, the, the German FCC possibly was trying to push, was not happy with the outcome of the ECB uh, decision-making process. Now, suddenly, uh, we are being told that, in fact, uh, there's nothing wrong with the ECB decisions because even though they didn't do anything meaningfully different, suddenly now the German government, on the basis of uh, new information disclosed to them by the ECB, uh, in fact, is convinced that, in fact, they do pay attention uh, to uh, the uh, economic impact of their monetary policy. So, in fact, possibly, it was... Uh, the wrong judgment at the wrong time, uh, and uh, it's going to boost, I'm afraid, autocratic forces, even though that's certainly not uh, the intention or intent of the German FCC to do so. In fact, yes, we're not even talking about courts uh, in the case uh, of the Polish uh, so-called constitutional tribunal. Uh, but let me conclude by just uh, reminding you of the old saying that the road to hell is quite often paved with uh, good intentions and possibly here, uh, the German FCC should have think twice <laughs> before nullifying, in effect, uh, uh, the ruling of the Court of Justice. So I think it's a bad day in the history of European integration. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Laurent. And uh, I must say that this brings to a close this fascinating uh, discussion. Uh, so I would really like to thank our panelists for, for joining us today, as well as our audience, of course, uh, for being with us um, and joining this virtual iteration of our Reconnect conference. Please join us for our fourth and final panel at 4 p.m., where many of the challenges faced by democracy and the rule of law in Europe, which have been discussed today, will be uh, reassessed through the prism of the COVID-19 crisis. So, Stay online and uh, join us again uh, at 4 p.m. Thank you and goodbye for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.